my favorite microbe, Geogemma borosi. Deep below the ocean of the Earth in hydrothermal vents lies an organism called Geogemma borosi. This organism belongs to the domain Archaea. Geogemma borosi is a cockroach shaped about 1.0 micrometers in diameter with lophotrichus like flagellation. The cell envelope consists of a cytoplasmic membrane, a periplasmic space, and a single outer surface layer, while the inside contains just a singular circular chromosome. Geogemma borosi was first discovered in 2003 in a deep sea black smoker hydrothermal vent called Fin. It's located in the Mothra hydrothermal vent field along the Endeavour segment of the Juan de Fuca Ridge in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. G. Barossi is a hyperthermophile, indicating that it can survive in high temperatures. Hyperthermophiles stabilize their proteins with extra hydrogen and covalent bonds between amino acids, which allow them to live in such high heat. Gibarosi is also known as strain 121 because it has an incredible growth range of 85 to 121 degrees Celsius with an optimal temperature of 115 degrees Celsius. In labs, 121 degrees Celsius is a sterilization temperature for laboratory autoclaves, but Gibarosi cells would still be multiplying at this heat. Autoclaving would usually kill most microorganisms and spores, but Geogemma borosi not only survived that, but was still growing. It can even survive at 130 degrees Celsius for two hours. Strain 121 is an obligate litho autotroph, meaning it needs and derives energy from reactions of reduced compounds of mineral origin. Hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean are a very sulfur and iron rich environment. Geogemma uses hydrogen as an electron donor and ferric iron to accept electrons. This metabolic path allows the microorganism to burn its food for energy. Gibberosi does not use other known electron acceptors. Chemically, the respiration process reduces ferric iron to ferrous iron and forms the mineral magnetite. Magnetite is just a magnetic form of iron that's a byproduct of the iron oxide. When the organism was absent, no magnetite was found. Lovely and Kashafi, who discovered this organism, even speculated that due to so much iron on Earth before life began and the numerous deposits of magnetite deep in the ocean, that electron transport to ferric iron may have been the first form of microbial respiration as life evolved. Due to living in the depths of the ocean and being the only microorganism that can survive at such a high temperature, no symbiosis, no symbiosis is seen between other organisms. Other microorganisms just would not be able to survive in the same habitat as Gibberosi. Humans are not likely to encounter this microorganism except for in a lab, so it poses no threat to humankind. Heat-loving organisms don't cause disease as they'll freeze at body temperature. So even if exposure does occur, the microorganism can only grow if there's iron present and would not divide anymore if temperatures go below 80 degrees Celsius. Geogemma borosi interacts with the environment via its unique iron respiration. Again, the area around the vents is very rich in iron and magnetite, which is the byproduct of its metabolism. The accumulation of ferric iron and hot sediments around marine hydrothermal vents might have led to ferric iron reduction being an important process in modern hydrothermal environments. Its unique metabolism and ability to live in high temperatures hints to the early forms of life on Earth and shows the potential for other life forms living in such harsh environments. The deep ocean is truly a whole other world that still contains so many mysteries. Maybe one day there'll be a microorganism that can live beyond 121 degrees Celsius, but for now, Geogemma borosi holds the impressive record of living at such an extreme temperature. Thank you. Hello, I'm Gigi Coughlin, and I'm going to talk about Batrochychoidetrium dendrobatitis. The common name is trithrid fungus, and it's an infamous fungus, but many researchers refer to it as BD. 
This fungus is infamous because of disease it causes in amphibians called Cytridiomycosis. The fungus itself is a rough spherical shape, smooth-walled, asexual, eukaryotic, and it's most infamously known for being a fungal pathogen. It belongs to the fungi kingdom and to the Batrochocotitraceae family. The fungus is unique as it is aquatic and produces flagellite zoospores. A zoospore is a spore that is able to actually swim. The life cycle of BD comes in two stages. First, we can see the um, we can observe the zoospore's dispersal, and the second lifestyle stage includes the development of monocentric thallus into a single zoospore sporangia. The zoosporangia produce, contain, and discharge the zoospores. The zoospores have an ovidal body shape, membrane-bound ribosomes, and most notably, they have a single flagellum. Zoospores have the single flagellum that helps the spores actually swim through water. The main way that the fungus affects infects a host is through the zoospores in water, but other ways are possible, like amphibian to amphibian contact. It's theorized that the Korean War actually began the spread of fungus, but other people have theorized that the fungus also spread through the illegal pet trade. However, it did spread to the rest of the world. BD has now become infamous for causes of citrodomycosis in amphibians. This is a skin disease that comes from the zoospores of BD. BD has now affected over 8,000 species, and it can be found in almost every can continent except Antarctica. Probably not Antarctica, because there's no known living species of amphibians in Antarctica. Amphibians have now become the most threatened vertebrate class in the planet. BD has caused many species to even go extinct. Species like Alatus obstetricans, known as the midwife toad, from the French Pyrenees, die quickly from the infection. But on the other hand, species like the American bulldog are actually resistant, but they can still be carriers, making them very dangerous to other amphibians. That's what I would call a real bully frog. <laughs> Cytrinophycosis is spread through contaminated water because frogs drink and breathe through their skin. The fungus is able to make its way by infecting the keratinized epidermal cells of amphibian skin and cause disease of chytridomycosis. Um, scientists have found that BD, BD unspoils the amphibians' proteins in their skin and breaks down the proteins, which results in kind of a spaghetti of amino acids. When a frog is infected, you can tell because they'll get something called red leg, and they'll be extremely sleepy and lethargic. But other than that, there's no real signs. And just a few weeks later, frogs can experience heart failure and pass away, leaving behind a mass graveyard of amphibians. They can... Scientists have yet to find a cure to the fungal infection or a way to make environments safe from the spores. But they can apply a topical fungicide to individual frogs, which has been successful, but it still remains difficult for researchers to apply this technique to an entire population. One way scientists have helped is by breeding captive amphibians of the populations that are most affected by BD in, in order to keep the species alive. Napping this fungus is extremely helpful for scientists to know the locations of BD to help minimize its spread to other areas, which is why apps like iNaturalist can be really helpful if anyone wants to help and become a citizen naturalist. Future research is also required to help minimize BD so we can protect the biodiversity of amphibians. Researchers have found that there's a host of immunity in some species where they produce antimicrobial peptides to combat the, the disease. This knowledge may find itself very helpful in future research when looking for a treatment. An important fact to remember is that while Clytro Trimdiomycosis from BD zoospores continues to kill many amphibians, it is still not the greatest threat to these species. The greatest threat continues to be habitat loss due to deforestation and habitat and climate change. Thank you.
Plasmodium. Plasmodium is a parasite, a type of eukaryotic single organism of the genus Protozoa, which is transmitted by the bite of an infected female Anopheles mosquito, causing a serious life-threatening disease called malaria. Malaria is especially prevalent on tropical and subtropical areas. Plasmodium has an interesting complex structure and anatomy. It has an elongated shape, usually between 2 to 2.5 micrometers in length and about 1 micrometer in width. It is composed of two cellular membranes, an outer cell membrane called plasmolemma, and an inner cytoplasmic membrane called glycocalyx. The plasmodium also possesses several unique organelles, including Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, and mitochondria, and a specialized organ called apicoplast, which is essential for the synthesis of proteins and lipids needed for the parasite survival. Plasmodium belongs to the phylum Apicomplexa, which includes organisms such as Cryptosporidium, Toxoplasm, and Cyclospora. The closest relatives to Plasmodium are Cryptosporidium parvon and Toxoplasma gondii, both of which belong to the same genus and are closely related in terms of genetic makeup and life cycles. The Plasmodium itself is further subdivided into several species, including Plasmodium vivax, Falciparum, Malaria, and Ovale. Each of these spe species is capable of causing different types of malaria in human host. Plasmodium require a specific nutrients for growth and metabolism. Sources of nutrients include proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, vitamins, and minerals. The plasmodium parasite obtain proteins from their host red blood cells and vitamin and minerals from the host plasmodium. The metabolism and growth is highly dependable on the environment and the availability of nutrients. This parasite uses glucose as its main source of energy to generate ATP molecules that are used in the growth, replication, and metabolic processes. It's also capable of performing both aerobic and anaerobic respiration depending on the availability of oxygen. In terms of growth, Plasmodium is able to undergo asexual reproduction through a process known as schizogony, in which the parasite replicates a genetically identical daughter cell that is released into the host bloodstream. In addition, Plasmodium is also capable of undergoing sexual reproduction through a process known as gametogony. In this process, the parasite produces gametocytes that will eventually undergo meiosis to form haploid gametes that can fuse to form a zygote. The life cycle of the malaria parasite is complex. Plasmodium spends part of its life cycle in a human host and the other part in a mosquito. In the human host, the plasmodium life cycle begins when an infected female Anopheles mosquito injects the parasite into a human's skin during a blood meal. The parasite then moves through the bloodstream, where it invades liver cells. This is the exoerythrocytic phase. Once inside the liver cells, the parasite multiplies to form thousands of daughter cells known as merocytes. Once the daughter cells are mature, they burst out of the liver and enter the bloodstream. This is where the erythrocytic phase starts. Here, the parasite invades the red blood cells, multiplies, and bursts out of <coughs> the red blood cells, entering the bloodstream once again. At this point, malaria symptoms are evident. Some of the parasites differentiate into sexual gametocytes at this point. This is where the gametocyte phase starts. These gametocytes are taken up by another Anopheles mosquito during a blood meal, and the plasmodium life cycle begins in the mosquito host. The parasite multiplies inside the mosquito mid-gut wall, <clears throat> and while in there, the microgametocytes fuse with macrogametocytes to form zygotes. The zygotes turn to oocytes that grow and rupture and release sporocytes, which make their way to the salivary glands of the mosquito to inoculate into the next human host. Plasmodium can also interact with environmental factors such as water, temperature, and humidity, which influence how it breeds, spreads, and affects health. Overall, plasmodium and its interactions with other organisms and environmental factors are complex and dynamic. Its ability to avoid detection, persist, and spread within ecosystems is an important factor that has enabled its survival as one of the most dangerous human and animal parasites affecting millions of people across the globe every year. In the year of 2021 alone, it was estimated that about 240 million cases of malaria happened. Most of these cases were presented in the African regions, affecting children under the age of 5. Plasmodium acts in a symbiotic relationship with the mosquito vector and the human host, benefiting from both. 
pathologically, the plasmodium has a detrimental effect on the health of the infected individual, causing symptoms such as fever, malaise, chills, vomit, anemia, jaundice, sometimes neurological complications, and even death, mainly also affecting infants and children under the age of 5. The environmental impact of plasmodium is considerable, and it makes it difficult to mitigate. Populations of infected people and the associated mosquito vectors are usually confined to regions leading to localized outbreaks. Additionally, due to the significant amount of resources that must be allocated to address the disease and its associated morbidity and mortality, governments in endemic regions are often forced into poverty. Also, due to the significant amount of insecticide, used in order to reduce the population and Anopheles mosquitoes runoff from application sites can be adversely affecting local ecosystems. In conclusion, Plasmodium alarmia has, is a significant infectious disease with far-reaching implications for human populations, particularly those in tropical and subtropical areas. It can cause both symbiotic and pathological effects with possible dire health outcomes and can also have environmental costs due to the resource expenditure, vector control, and vector killing runoff.
My name is Hillary and I did my term project on RSV. RSV is a significant pathogen that primarily affects vulnerable populations, including infants, young children, and the elderly, causing acute lower respiratory tract infections. RSV is highly contagious and mainly spreads through respiratory droplets, making it particularly transmittable in crowded environments like daycare centers and nursing homes. RSV infection can cause mild cold-like symptoms to severe bronchitis and pneumonia, which can be life-threatening in susceptible populations. Effective management and prevention strategies are essential in preventing long-term respiratory issues, such as asthma that may result from RSV infection. RSV is a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus that belongs to the Phenovidia family. RSV has a diameter of 120 to 300 nm, a spherical or fleomorphic shape, a lipid envelope derived from the host cell membrane, and two surface glycoproteins, fusion F and attachment G, crucial for viral entry and infection. The virus produces 11 proteins that aid in viral replication and assembly and can lead to the transformation, the formation of Cynthia in infection respiratory epithelial cells, contributing to severe respiratory symptoms. RSV is highly viable in morphology and structure, with even the same viral strain exhibiting different filamentous forms that facilitate its spread and penetration deeper into the respiratory tract. RSV can disrupt the respiratory microbiome, leading to dysbiosis and increased colonization by potentially pathogenic bacteria, resulting in increased disease severity and secondary bacterial infections. RSV infection can lead to increased colonization by Streptococcus pneumonia, a common cause of bacteria pneumonia, which can worsen disease severity and increase the risk of mortality. RSV infection can also interact with other viruses, such as influenza virus, to cause more severe respiration disease, respiratory disease. These interactions between RSV and other microorganisms highlight the complex nature of respiratory infections that need for a multifaceted approach to prevent and treat. RSV's growth in metabolism can be influenced by the environmental factors such as temperature and humidity. Low humidity can enhance the survival and transmission of RSV in the air, while high humidity can reduce the spread of RSV by decreasing the stability of the virus, virus's particles in the air. RSV can interact with environmental pollution such as particulate matter, PM, and ozone, which can exuberate respiratory symptoms, and increase the risk of RSV infections. RSV can be detected in various environmental sources, including wastewater and river water samples, suggesting that the virus can persist in aquatic environments. RSV re relies entirely on the host cell machinery for its survival and replication, and its replication is highly demand de dependent on the availability of host factors, such as lipids, amino acids, and energy sources. RSV's avail ability to invade the host immune response in established persistent infections presents a significant challenge in developing effective vaccines and therapeutics. <clears throat> effective management and prevention, prevention strategies, such as good hygiene practices and Isolation precautions are essential in preventing RSV transmission. Developing effective prevention and control strategies for RSV will require a deeper understanding of its interactions with other microorganisms in the respiratory tract and how these interactions impact disease outcomes. Understanding the symbi symbiotic Pathological and environmental impacts of RSV is critical in developing effective prevention and control strategies against this significant respiratory pathogen. Further research is needed to gain a comprehensive understanding of the virus's behavior interactions with the environment and its impact on human health. Thank you. I'm going to be talking about the hepatitis B virus. 
The hepatitis B virus is a small DNA virus, and it's important because it can cause hepatitis, which is liver inflammation. Here's a little bit of information about the taxonomy of the hepatitis B virus, all the way from the kingdom down to the family. And just to break down this family name here, which is Hepadna viridae, you can see it contains hep for liver. It contains the letters DNA and viridae for virus. The shape, it's a very small virus. In the middle of it, it has double-stranded DNA. And that DNA is surrounded by a capsid. And the overall shape of the hepatitis B vi virus is spherical. So it has the DNA in the middle, surrounded by a capsid, surrounded by an envelope, and there are three different hepatitis B antigens. Related viruses is there's a hepatitis B um, related uh, genus that infects reptiles and frogs. There's a genus that infects birds, and there's the genus that infects mammals, which contains the, the actual human and ape hepatitis B virus. There are other viruses that cause hepatitis, inflammation of the liver, but they're not hepatinaviridae, so they're not really related. So there's this hepatitis A, which is caused by a picornaviridae virus, hepatitis C, and others. Transmission. Hepatitis B can be transmitted by blood and other body fluids through childbirth, sex, sharing of needles, unsterile medical devices, and sharing of personal items such as toothbrushes, nail clippers, razors, things like that that might contain traces of blood. Here are the steps of DNA virus replication, all the way from attachment, where the virus attaches to the liver cell, internalization, it's brought into the liver cell, fusion, and then brought to the nucleus. DNA repairment, there's some changes that are made to the DNA. And then there's transcription, translation, and capsidation, reverse transcription, and then synthesis of the new DNA and synthesis of the new virus, which is then released from the liver cell to travel um, to other places. In 2018, there were 3,322 cases of hepatitis B and 1,649 deaths. Um, these numbers are probably very um, low as and a lot of cases um, unreported according to the CDC. And then over 1 million in the US are living with hepatitis B infection. Two thirds of people are unaware, which is very important because it does have a 60 to 90 day incubation where, during which time there are no, no symptoms. So people could be infected with hepatitis B and be unaware because they're not going to show symptoms until 60 to 90 days. Symptoms include fever, malaise, low appetite, nausea, abdominal discomfort, and dark urine. Hep B is diagnosed by a blood test, which tests for the various hepatitis B antigens in the blood. Prevention is key to preventing the spread of this disease. And that can be done by universal precautions in healthcare, not sharing personal items such as razors, toothbrushes, nail clippers, vaccination, and disinfection with a one to 10 bleach solution. Vaccination is really important. Um, everybody, it's recommended that everybody be vaccinated for hepatitis B. And chill, it's recommended that infants get their first vaccine within 24 hours of birth. In summary, hepatitis B is a virus that can cause serious liver disease and death. And it is preventable through vaccination, universal precautions, and safe practices. Human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, is an epidemic that has been seriously affecting people worldwide for decades. It is notorious for disproportionately affecting people in lower socioeconomic classes and countries, as well as members of the LGBTQ community. An important distinction to be made is the difference between HIV and acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS, 
which is the disease that can be caused by a chronic HIV infection. HIV comes from a genus of retroviruses called lentiviruses, which are known for their long incubation times and the severity of the diseases that they cause. There are two species of lentivirus that infect humans, HIV-1 and 2. HIV-1 is spread throughout the world and is thought to have a greater rate of transmission as well as a higher likelihood of progression to AIDS, whereas HIV-2 is found mostly in West Africa and is less transmissible. HIV-1 can infect some of our closest relatives, such as chimpanzees, gorillas, and some species of monkeys. HIV is a single-stranded RNA virus which forms virions approximately 125 nanometers in diameter. As a virus, HIV is metabolically inert on its own. However, there is evidence that HIV preferentially uh, infects metabolically active T cells instead of inert T cells. HIV has an interesting history. Um, it was first diagnosed in the United States in 1981, and uh, research has, has led to the theory that HIV first originated in the human population in the 1920s as a zoonotic disease. Investigations into a more specific cross-species jump event led to the discovery that HIV-2 had originated in a type of monkey called the Sudi mangabe, and that HIV-1 originated in central chimpanzees. The first person documented with a case of AIDS was reported to be a gay sex worker in San Francisco in 1981, and from that time on there has continued to be a stigma associating LGBTQ people with HIV and AIDS. Ethnic minorities are also disproportionately affected by HIV, both in the United States as well as globally. The introduction of antiviral medications for HIV has improved the outlook for many facing infection. However, this improvement has not crossed over strongly into Black and Latin American communities. HIV infection panic has died down in recent years due to the success of antiretroviral drugs, and it is, but it is still extremely prevalent and deadly in other areas of the world such as Sub-Saharan Africa, where 70% of all new HIV infections occurred in 2013. The HIV life cycle begins with an initial infection via contact with bodily fluids. After infection, the HIV virion will bind to a CD4 helper T cell of the immune system. The virion recognizes the CD4 protein on the surface of the T cells via their envelope protein. The binding of the envelope protein to the CD4 protein and its co-receptors causes a structural change in the virion's glycoprotein, which causes it to insert a hydrophobic region into the lipid membrane of the T cell, opening up a pore in the membrane through which the viral capsid can enter into the cytoplasm. Re reverse transcriptase then transcribes the single-stranded viral RNA contained within the capsid into double-stranded DNA, which is transported across the nuclear membrane. Once the double-stranded viral DNA is within the nucleus of the T cell, it begins to produce it begins the process of integrating itself into the host T cell's genome using the glyco, using the protein integrase. The host cell begins to produce both new genetic material for future virions as well as new viral proteins, which begin migrating the new viral RNA out of the nucleus where it can be packaged into new virions. Several uh, viral proteins function to reduce the number of immune recognition receptors that are present on the host cell in order to help hide it from uh, the immune system. Structurally, HIV can take one of two shapes after it is budded off from the infected host cell, depending upon whether it has matured or not, and the maturation process is accomplished by the HIV protein protease, which allows the virion to transform into its mature form. AIDS is the most advanced pathological side effect of HIV infection and comes about 2 to 15 years after the initial infection. Uh, it occurs after an, a, a, about of acute HIV symptoms have gone away for several years, uh, it then it, uh, begins when the concentration of CD4 T cells begins to drop drastically in the body. Uh, the primary dan danger associated with AIDS is the extreme vulnerability of the body to opportunistic pathogens present in the environment that a healthy individual would have little difficulty fighting off. There's currently no cure for AIDS or HIV, and thus uh, much of the focus in research has been on antiretroviral drugs.
SARS-CoV-2 is the specific virus that caused the COVID-19 pandemic that swept over the world in 2020. SARS-CoV-2 is from the coronaviridae family, which also contains viruses such as SARS-CoV-1, which caused the SARS outbreak of the early 2000s, and MERS-CoV, which causes MERS. SARS-CoV is a spherical shape with spike-like projections on its surface that give it the appearance of a crown or corona, which is how the virus got its name. It has a linear, positive-sense, single-stranded RNA genome. The virus ranges in size from 60 to 140 nanometers in diameter, making it larger than any other RNA virus. SARS-CoV-2 is, is made up of four structural proteins, the spike, envelope, membrane, and nucleocapsid proteins, as you can see here on my sculptural diagram. The nucleocapsid protein contains the RNA genome, and the spike, envelope, and membrane proteins together form the viral envelope around the RNA. The spike proteins protrude strikingly from the envelope, as you can see here in red. SARS-CoV-2 is a virus, so it technically is not considered a living organism. Thus, it does not have the same metabolic requirements as other living microbes. Viruses do not grow, develop, consume nutrients, or produce waste products. Instead, viruses rely on host cells to provide them with the resources that they need to replicate and spread, specifically the cell's replication machinery. SARS-CoV-2 seems to have lived in other mammals, most likely bats, before it mutated to be able to infect humans. The virus interacts with humans most commonly by causing respiratory illness. The virus spreads from person to person through respiratory droplets. Once the virus enters the body, it infects host cells, particularly the cells of the lungs and respiratory system. The virus enters the host cells by using its spike protein to bind with the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor on the cell surface. This binding triggers a conformational change in the spike protein, which allows it to fuse with the host cell membrane and release its viral genetic material into the host cell. Once inside the host cell, the virus uses the host cell's replication machinery to replicate its RNA to produce more viral proteins. The newly replicated viral proteins and RNA then assemble into new viruses, which are then released from the infected host cell and go on to infect more cells, continuing the spread of the virus. As the virus is hijacking the cells and spreading, symptoms such as cough, fever, and shortness of breath ensue. Other symptoms such as fever ch and chills are caused by the body's immune response to the virus as it tries to fight it off. While SARS-CoV-2 most notably infects humans, it can also infect and um, cause illness in other mammals such as cats, dogs, and ferrets. Pathologically, SARS-CoV-2 is highly infectious and has with a range of respiratory symptoms such as mild cough to to severe pneumonia to respiratory failure. The virus is caused by hundreds of millions of cases of illness worldwide and tens of millions of deaths. Most people recover from the illness. However, many, especially those with compromised immune systems, the disabled and the elderly have died. Also, long COVID is a syndrome where individuals who have recovered from acute COVID-19 infection continue to experience symptoms or develop new symptoms for weeks or months after their initial illness. We don't yet know why people get long COVID or know specifics about its pathology. Much research still needs to be done on it and its continued effects. Finally, and seemingly most significantly to the world right now, are the social impacts of the virus. The coronavirus pandemic caused global lockdowns and travel restrictions worldwide. This caused the economy and most of the world to come to a screeching halt. There was also immense strain placed on the world's healthcare systems as they needed to pivot to deal with a new and sudden pandemic. The pandemic quite literally changed all of our lives. The pandemic also caused many people to become more mindful of the microbes and their impacts. Many have started taking hygiene and masking more seriously in many parts of the world, which fortuitously also caused cases of other respiratory viruses such as the common cold and the flu to plummet in 2020. Three years on from the pandemic and we still see every day how society was put through a massive upheaval. Only time will tell the long-term effects and health effects and social effects of, of SARS-CoV-2 and the COVID-19 pandemic and what that has done to all of us.
Um, life, si life cycle of a cold sore. Cold sores can last anywhere between 7 to 10 days and appear on the mouth, cheek, nose, and even the eyes. Um, they go through um, five different stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, which is the cresting stage, and stage five, which is the healing stage. Uh, before stage one, um, as mentioned before, um, a person with this virus has triggers um, um, that can make a cold sore appear. If one does trigger the cold sore, then the virus will start to attack the healthy cells. Uh, stage one. Um, during stage, um, you can you will start to feel tingling, itching, swell, and a swelling sensation. Um, on this example, you'll feel it around the mouth. Um, a way to get ahead of the virus is to start treating it right away. Um, this is so you can reduce the severity. Uh, stage two. This will either happen between one to two days later. Um, it will result um, in more bumps appearing on the skin and they will be fluid fi filled blisters. Um, it is best to avoid certain foods during this stage. Um, these foods include citrus, spicy, um, salty, and even hot liquids. Uh, stage 3. Um, during stage 3, this is when the cold sores will finally appear. Um, they'll appear as a red and hollow bump. Uh, bumps. Um, it will look like a cluster of bumps. Um, on the area. Uh, stage four, the crusting stage. Um, during the stage, this is when the blisters are finally going to um, dry out. They are going to be characterized as being a yellow or even a brown color. Stage five, the healing stage. This is going to be the last stage of the cold sore life cycle. Um, during this stage, the blisters are finally going to scab, o scab over and start to heal. Um, they are sl slowly going to go away by flaking off. Hello class. So for the final term project, I chose the virus Ebola. The Ebola virus outbreak was heard around the world as it killed many people in Africa during the epidemic from 2013 to 2016. As this virus spread through Africa, many people and epidemiologists were shocked on how gruesome the victims of the virus were left behind as the people of Africa fought against the virus as they faced an uphill battle since they had limited resources and help from other countries. This first, the virus was first found in Africa in 1976 in the Democratic Republic of Congo, also known as DRC. Um, the total mortality was 11,325 people. And you can see an image of the virus on the lower right hand side. The classification of this virus is the flow of viridine that measured about 14,000 nanometers in length with a curvy shape on the end and a diameter of 80 nanometers. At the time, there were only two species known to fall under this classification, which were the Marbin and the Ebola virus. These two viruses were similar as both caused hemorrhagic fever. The uniqueness of this virus is its shape as a pleophorbic, which has the ability to alter their morphology, biological features, and reproductive modes in response to the environment and their conditions. This microorganism is a single-stranded um, RNA virus that causes a great dread, that caused a great dread to many people. Some symptoms um, early would be fever, headache, dizziness, and then another stage would be high fever, massive bloody and vomiting. And the third stage would re usually result in death is damage to blood cells from severe hemorrhaging. And um, some survivors did have some long lasting turn, um, symptoms like joint pain, muscle pain, loss of hearing, and even eyesight.
Transmission from Ebola was mainly through bodily fluids like saliva, blood, mucus, and vomit, and even um, feces. Um, scientists believe um, fruit bats were the main carriers of the virus due to evidence found in Africa. The way humans began to be carriers of this violent virus has been unknown. Scientists have many theories for the transmission of the virus to humans. For example, they believe people of Africa either ate infected tissues like fruit, bats, deers, and um, apes and stuff like that. But also there's another theory saying that they might have either been bitten or scratched by uh, most likely bats since the virus does change the behavior of either the host or victim and you can see a cycle here how the um, animals can contract it to one another it is airborne between animals but it is not airborne in humans. Only human to human can pass it to each other through bodily fluids and same thing for animals. So for the Ebola virus, although the origin of the virus is unknown, scientists do know this virus needs a healthy host for nutrients. As the virus metabolizes, it invades the lymph nodes and vital organs such as kidneys and liver. The main reason this virus causes death is not the virus itself, but the overload to the human immune system. This overload is called a cytokine storm that causes an explosion of our immune system that damages our blood vessels, which lead to internal bleeding and external bleeding as well. The growth process of this virus starts by attaching to microphages within the human body that are responsible for the immune system, then, get, then they get embedded within the host-derived lipid envelope of the Ebola virus, are glycoprotein spikes that bind to the cells and meditate, no, mediate fusion between the viral envelope and the host cells membrane, enabling the virus to release its contents into the host cells cytoplasm. The symbiotic between microphages and filamentous organisms then courses through the, our bloodstream, neutralizing our immune systems, which allow it to proliferate within 2 to 21 days of infection. And it wasn't until 2018 um, when three antiviral treatments were provided to the people of Africa, which were Zampap, Favi, Pirivi, and Remdesivir. The, um, the epidemic of Ebola pressured the FDA so much that at the time of the release of these vaccines, they had not been clinically tested, verified the efficiency and safety of their treatments, basically giving the people of Africa a false hope with untested um, vaccines. As you can see here, the first vaccine, Zampap, um, was used as to a, as an anti antibody agent at, which attacked the Ebola virus, and it was effective at a 50% rate, and Favipiravi inhibited viral RNA polymerase, which also was effective at 50%. And the third vaccine, which was not affected at all, which was meant to attack the nucleotide analog of the virus. Um, but these three vaccines were still not as effective, um, still due to the fact that um, people were still dying, even though they were being um, treated with these vaccines. The mortality rate did drop from 90% to 25%, but it was, like I said, not enough. Um, and the death rate did reach about 11,325 people in the continent of Africa. Um, but nurses were also when they didn't have any treatment, they were just rehydrating their patients since a lot of them would have high fevers as well. So that was pretty effective as well, about 25%. Um, this highly virulent virus had caused a train wreck in Africa, hurting its environment, hurting its people, 
hurting um, animals and other species as well, even the soil and their air around them as all the dead bodies just kind of kept piling up. As thousands of people each day making worldwide headlines um, were dying, it wasn't enough for powerful countries to help them um, since they um, were struggling. Most of them did not see this as a good investment due to the low number of people who were infected. In fact, many research did not jump on board as well due to low economic investment as the virus only affected poor countries that had no, had poor sanitation values. But at the end of the epidemic, which was in 2016, the people of Africa were left with lingering repercussions of the nightmare that had endured with no to little help from their neighboring countries.